Well, it is a joy to come and to open God's word with you this morning. It is, uh, it's a bit overwhelming for me. Um, we had prayed that God would allow us to come to this church for several years. And uh, we knew Pastor Dan and, and many of you, and we had visited several times. And it's funny, we would come and visit, and someone's like, are you, are you a member here? Because we had come so many times, but then in God's goodness, he allowed us to come. And to stay and, and to serve with you and, and to get to know you. And <laughs> but we are thankful for you. We, we love you. And, and we know you love us. And so it is a joy to come and be a part of a church that, even as we heard in, in membership, is, is committed to one another. Committed to the word of God. And committed to helping each other and evangelizing the lost and discipling one another and doing all the things that God has called us to do because we are committed to Christ. We are committed to live for him. We are committed to live a holy and blameless life that is set apart from the world so that we can shine the light of Christ in the world in which we live, even as we heard this morning in Philippians chapter 2. And that is my hope today is to, is to help us to, to further equip us, if you will, to continue in our commitment that we have made to a blameless life with God's words that are found in Psalm 101. And so if you would stand with us in honor of God's word, and I'm going to read Psalm 101 with us. Be reading from the uh, NASB 95 edition now. And, and so it is a Psalm of David, Psalm 101. And he writes, I will sing of loving kindness and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will give heed to the blameless way. When will you come to me? I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. No one who has a haughty look or an arrogant heart will I endure. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. He who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. Every morning I will destroy all the wicked of the land so as to cut off from the city of the Lord all those who do iniquity. You may be seated. And we know that David had been chosen by God to rule over Israel as king. And as he was about to become king, he writes Psalm 101. And in some ways, you might say that this is his coronation speech or his inaugural address or maybe even his oath of office. God had chosen David and David wanted to honor God as he was about to begin to fulfill the purpose that God had for his life to be the king of Israel. To be an example to God's people, Israel. To point his people to him. And he writes this psalm to voice his commitment before God and before the people of how he will live out that commitment to them. It is a commitment, as the title says, to a blameless life. And I want us to look carefully today at how David proposed to live out his commitment because his approach is very practical and very clear in Psalm 101. And so when you forget the sermon, you can go back to Psalm 101 and God's words can speak very clearly to you of how you can keep your commitment to a blameless life. If we will make the same, equip equipment, same commitment as well as David did, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can, as Philippians 2 says, prove ourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom we appear as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. But before we begin to look at those two practical ways, I want us to notice first that it is a personal commitment. 
And we see that in all of the I will statements that David puts here. He says, I will, verse 1, sing of loving kindness. I will sing praises. I will give heed to the blameless way, verse 2. I will walk in my house in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before me, in verse 3. I will know no evil, in verse 4, and on and on and on. It is a personal commitment that he is making to God. To live for and to exemplify God. And that's what we see even in verse 1. It's a personal commitment to live for and to exemplify God. He says, I will sing of loving kindness and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. It is a personal commitment to live for God and to exemplify Him. And the two attributes of God that He thinks about and that He is praising God for and He wants to exemplify most are God's loving kindness and His justice. As he thinks about how God has dealt with him in his life, David recalls the blessings of loving kindness that God has shown him and God's just judgment of those sinners who are around him, the evildoers who have persecuted him, and not only that, God's just judgment of his own sin. This word loving kindness is that Hebrew word has said, and for you Hebrew scholars, that is the correct mispronunciation of that word. But we're not so concerned about that. What we want is the meaning of it. What does it mean that God is a God of loving kindness? Some of your translations may say that it is steadfast love or, or loyal love. And some even have that it is mercy. And it is all of those things. And it's really hard to translate. But I like loving kindness. Because it reminds me that in all things that God does, he is loving. And he expresses that often in just being kind to us. When we are undeserved and we need his mercy. And yet it is steadfast and it is loyal and it is unchanging because it is who God is. He is the God of loving kindness and justice. And so whenever we go to him, we will always know what to expect. He's a God of loving kindness. God of justice. His justice is his righteousness. It is his just judgment of sin. It is his, his being just in all things. It, we don't always think about things being fair, but God is always just. It is always going to be just. He is just when he judges the wicked, when he judges the unrighteous, when he punishes the guilty. He even puts human law enforcement and governors and judges in, in our world so that he, they can mete out his justice. And so God is full of loving kindness and justice. And these two attributes of God are perfectly united. He is full of loving kindness and he is full of justice. We see this even in Exodus 34 and verse 6 when God describes himself to Moses. He says in Ezekiel 34, or Exodus, Exodus 34, 6, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. He is a God of loving kindness and justice, and those two attributes are in perfect unity. And by the way, these are two attributes that are communicable attributes, meaning that we can exhibit these attributes as well. We can show loving kindness and we can exhibit justice. And that's why David brings out these two main things in his inaugural address. He wants to exhibit these two attributes in his kingdom. He wants them to define his reign as king of Israel. He wants to be the king when the people come to him that he, they see loving kindness. And he wants to be the kind of king that when they bring their issues to him, that he is going to be a king of justice. He wants to exhibit God's attributes so when the people come to him and they say, that is so great. You are so full of loving kindness and you are such a just judge of your people. He can point them to his God and his king who showed him and taught him how to be that way. And they can both together sing of his loving kindness and justice. David wants to exhibit those things. 
It is a personal commitment he is making here to live for and to exemplify God. And to do things God's way, as you see in verse 2 there. He says, I will give heed to the blameless way. The blameless way. Psalm 18 and verse 30 says, as for God, his way is blameless. It is the blameless way. And the Hebrew word here for blameless has the idea of something that is, is unobjectionable. It is even used of sacrificial animals or something that is without blemish. In the human context, it describes a life that cannot be criticized because it is, because it is lived in a way that is contrary to the Bible. But rather, it is characterized by someone who is pursuing holiness, who is pursuing righteousness and godliness, living according to God's word, and everyone can see it. In the New Testament, it describes the qualifications of an elder. They are blameless, or they are above reproach in their home, in their church, and in their community. We even see in the Old Testament a man named Job, who is Blameless, God says, and it helps us to see kind of what this word means when he talks about Job in Job 1.1. It says, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. That's the blameless life. Psalm 119 and verse 1 says this, how blessed are those whose ways is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. And so we see this aspect where the Bible defines blamelessness as someone who is upright, fearing God, turning away from evil, and following the law of the Lord. We're doing our best to be pleasing to God and live this blameless life. And all of God's people have been called to be blameless, to be that kind of a person. Even as far back as Genesis 17, when Abram is told this, he's 99 years old, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Deuteronomy 18, 13, he tells Israel, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. And even as we read in Philippians 2, 15, we are to be blameless and innocent children of God. And so we see that God's chosen people are exhorted throughout Scripture to be blameless. And we are committed to live a blameless life when we commit ourselves to God through Jesus Christ. And so David is committed to that blameless life. And that's what he is saying there when he says, I will give heed to the blameless way. I will give heed to the blameless way. Now, your translation may say, I will ponder the blameless way or I will consider the blameless way. And, and sometimes our English use of that word doesn't really convey what the Hebrew means. When you, when you say that in the Hebrew, they expect something to happen. You know, when you hear the Shema in, in Deuteronomy 6, 5, and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is our one. You shall love the Lord with all of your heart and mind and soul and strength. It's not just hear this and kind of let it go in one ear and out the other and, you know, think about it if you want to do it. No, it's hear this and I'm going to leave you to do it and I expect to have it done and you'll be doing it when I come back. It's like you tell your children that, right? Clean up your room. Okay, listen to me. Ah, oh, listen, but... No, I expect you to be doing that. And that's the idea that it has here. It's giving heed. It is understanding. It is comprehending it. But it also has the idea with the intent to, to achieve something, the intent to be successful at it. And so when I get, David says, I give heed to the blameless way, he is saying, I am resolved to understand it, to comprehend it, to pursue it, and to have success in this blameless way. I am committed to a blameless way. I am committed to what God has said. And so it is a personal commitment David is making. It is to live for and to exemplify God and his ways. And David gets even a little more personal at the end of verse 2 there, where he says, I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. You know, keeping that commitment to a blameless life, David knows and we know, begins in our home. With our own personal walk with the Lord in the integrity of our heart. That's where it starts. When no one else is around. Just me and God. David says, I will strive to be blameless even when I know no one will see 
and no one will know what I'm doing in the privacy of my home, in the integrity of my heart. By the way, if you ever think that you are alone and no one knows what you're doing when you're alone at home, then you've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Because you have forgotten Psalm 130 that says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all of my ways. I can't get away from you. Dark is like light for you. You see everything. You know everything. You are omniscient. Don't exchange the truth of God for a lie and think that you're alone. Walk within our house in the integrity of our heart before God. That's where it starts. If you haven't forgotten Psalm 139, we know God is with us everywhere. And we walk within our house in the integrity of our heart. And we enjoy this sweet fellowship with God. We are singing His praises. We are listening to Him. We are thinking about Him. We are considering how we might love Him more and serve others more. And it is a wonderful thing to do. How might I better fulfill my commitment to a blameless life before God? Well, David knows and we know that keeping a commitment to a blameless life begins in our home with our own personal walk with the Lord. And then he writes down some practical ways he intends to help him keep his commitment to that blameless life. And in your outline there, you have two practical ways, practical ways to keep his commitment. We must guard the two key influences in our lives, and we must practice two key disciplines in our lives. And first, he wants to show us we must guard two key influences in our lives. And those two key influences are what and who we allow to influence us. What and who we allow to influence us. And first, he begins there with what he allows to influence him in verse 3. He says, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. Well, that should have your thoughts running a thousand miles an hour of all the different worthless things we have set before our eyes today. Worthless here has the idea of no value. It is good for nothing. It is mindless. It is nothingness. But yet... It has no worth in helping me keep my commitment to a blameless life. Quite the opposite is often true. Worthless things can hinder me and tempt me to break my commitment. Some Bibles translate this word worthless as evil, vile, wicked, ungodly, destructive. These things would keep David from being the king that God has called him to be. They keep us from being the kind of person that God would call us to be, even if it's just mindless nothingness. What am I doing in my home in the integrity of my heart that is helping me to keep my commitment? You think about what could David have set before his eyes. Well, he didn't have TV and internet and things like that, but boy, there were festivals and there were banquets and there was art and there was music and there was entertainment and there was writings. There were all kinds of things that were there. We fall for the same kinds of things since the beginning of time. The same temptations that God has always said. This, that's why it says in 1 Corinthians ten thirteen that no temptation has overcome you, but such as is common to man. We've been falling for the same temptations for Satan, from Satan for 2,000 years, for thousands of years since the beginning, 10,000 years, if you will. But, you know, we're falling for the same things. But now, today, we know what those worthless, worthless things are and how the world constantly tries to set them before our eyes. And creates new ways to set them before our eyes. Whether it's the TV or the internet or books or magazines or board games or video games. And you can go on and on and on. David just says, anything I set before my eyes. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. Because I know it's going to influence me. Away from my commitment. And by the way, as you're thinking about all the things that the world is trying to influence us with and all of that stuff, maybe it's helpful at this time to define the term influence. Because we live in the postmodern world and, and 
your truth can be your truth, my truth can be my truth, and we can define things however we want. It's important for us to be on the same page of what we're calling influence. I think the English dictionary definition of influence is quite telling. And if we set this, it, this definition in our minds, we would be reminded of the, the seriousness of these things we set before our eyes. The term influencer is used rather flippantly today, but the reality of it is very significant. My English dif dif uh, dictionary defines influence in this way. Influence to have power to change the behavior of. Influence. The power to produce an effect without using force. I'll read that to you again. The power to change be the behavior of. Influence. The power to produce an effect without using force. And Satan wants to influence us for evil. And he uses the world system to constantly put worthless things before our eyes. And they don't force us to change. But they know they have the power to subtly seduce us away from the blameless way and desensitize us to things that are evil. They just have to get it before our eyes often enough and long enough and repetitively enough. And they know they have the power to produce the behavioral change that they want without using any force. Perhaps that's why David says, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. We choose what to and what not to set before our eyes. And we have to be careful. Because the things that we set before our eyes today are undeniably and unashamedly intent on influencing us for good or for evil. And the more evil things we set before our eyes and we allow before our eyes, uh, the more tempted we are to compromise our commitment. But on the other hand, the more godly things we put before our eyes, the more uncompromising we become in keeping our commitment to that blameless life. Romans 12 says this, Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So David reminds us that we must be very careful what we set before our eyes, what we allow to influence our lives if we are to keep our commitment to a blameless life. But we also must be very careful who we allow to influence our lives. And that's the next thing he talks about, who we allow to influence our lives. In verse, verses 3 through 7, he has five different types of people that we have to be careful not to allow to influence our lives. And here David is speaking about the people who you allow to influence you by spending time with them, by, by befriending them, by going along with them, by chatting with them, by listening to their counsel. For David at his inauguration, you might say he is setting up maybe his presidential cabinet as we would see it today. And he is saying, these are the kinds of people I do and I do not want to help me make decisions in my life. And it begins with the negative. The people he would not allow to influence him. Describing some of the types of people he would not allow into his life, into the inner circle of his kingdom. The people he knew that would influence him away from his blameless commitment to the commitment to a blameless life. Because he understood that bad company corrupts good morals. Well, that's 1 Corinthians 15.33 and he's in the Old Testament. Well, if you think it's just an Old New Testament thing, ask Solomon about his wives. They led him astray and led him away from his commitment to the Lord. Shouldn't have had wives anyway. Well, the first type of person David commits not to allow himself to be influenced by is found in the second part of verse 3, and we will call them the apostate. He says, I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip on me. The apostate are those who have fallen away from the faith. 
fallen away from following God's word and living for him. They have abandoned their previous loyalty to God. John says in 1 John, they went out from us because they were not of us. Now, most of us know someone like this. It could be a family member. It could be a fellow co-worker. It could be a neighbor. It could even be a former church member. Someone who has abandoned their faith. And the reality is they often try to get us to abandon our faith as well. And that is why David says, it shall not fasten its grip on me. The work of the apostate. He knows that they will try to fasten their grip on him and pull him away from his commitment to a blameless life. And you may have people like that who used to walk with the Lord and maybe you were friends with them and, and they have fallen away and they have become apostate and they have denied Christ and like, oh, it's just a bunch of rules and, and you're just duped or you're in a cult or whatever it is. They want to pull you away from your commitment to God. And so we have to be very careful with them. You may still have relationships with some of them. So be very careful, God says. Don't let them fasten their grip on you. The second type of person David commits not to allow himself to be influenced by the perverse. The perverse found in verse 4 there. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. The perverse, those who are perverse in heart. And what that word means is someone who is obstinately opposed to what is right. They stubbornly resist the truth and they also try to twist this, the truth or pervert it and distort it to mean what they want it to mean. They just pervert everything. And their goal is to cause us to turn away from the straight and narrow path, the clear teachings of God's word. Their great question is, has God said? Is that really what that means? It is a characteristic of the false teachers found in Acts 20 where Paul talks to the elders at Ephesus and he says this, I know that my, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. From among your own shells, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. He also writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3. He says, those are the ones who advocate a different doctrine and do not agree with the sound words, those of the Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness. They are conceited and understand nothing, but they have a morbid interest in controversial questions, disputes about words, out of which arise envy and strife and abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind who are deprived of the truth. They won't accept God's word because it demands that they submit to it and change. And so they try to twist it around. They call good evil and evil good. And David says, I will know no evil. He will not listen to them. They must depart from me, he says. He will have nothing to do with them. Proverbs 11.20 says this, The perverse in heart are an abomination to the Lord, but the blameless in their walk are his delight. So be careful. The third type of person David commits not to allow himself to be influenced by, found in verse 5, are the gossips. He says, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, I will destroy. The gossips. Always going around spreading rumors about other people. Secretly slandering their neighbor. Intentionally giving false reports intended to do harm to the good name and reputation of someone else. You know why they do it? So they can feel better about themselves. If I put you down and make you look less, then that makes me feel better about myself. Understand that gossip is no small thing. God takes gossip very seriously. If you consider Romans one twenty nine, they are in the list of those kinds of people who have suppressed the truth and of unrighteousness, have denied God, and he has turned them over to their depraved mind. The 
Ephesians 4, 31 says this, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. It is so important to God that his people not slandered that he gave the right, the kings the right to destroy them. David says, I will destroy them. And whether that is fully destroying them or executing them or some kind of just judgment like that, or simply the other way that word is translated, which means silence. I'm going to silence the gossips. I'm not going to hear it. I'm not going to listen to them. And please be careful if you're around these people. As Proverbs 18, 8 warns us, the words of a whisperer are like dainty morsels and they go down to the innermost parts of the body. Those juicy little tidbits of information about somebody, they're hard to resist sometimes and pass on. And don't disguise it in the form of a prayer request. Stay away from them. Or you might become one of them. The fourth type of person that David commits not to allow himself to be influenced by are the prideful. The prideful in the second part of verse 5. He who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure No one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. They're proud, they're arrogant, they're haughty, they're boastful. And by the way, these are the kinds of people that the world exalts. If you watch any kind of sports, they exalt the proud and the haughty and the arrogant and the boastful. And so it's easy to be deceived by them because it may mean being seen with them makes you popular in the eyes of the world. Who are you to judge them? Well, they're not humble. Well, you know, they're great. Look how great they are. But they are self-centered, not God-centered. They are prideful, not humble. And they will lead you into that same kind of mindset because it gets the praise of men. David says, interestingly, I will not endure them. Because often these people who are proud and haughty really have a good skill set at something. They're really good at what they do. And they're proud of it. And they're haughty and they're arrogant. But David says, I will not endure them. And it reminds me of people that used to work for me and, and man, they were great at their job, but they were so arrogant and so haughty and so self-exalting and all of those things. And you think, man, you know, they think and you think, I can't do it without them. We need them. You may have somebody like that at your work. Does a great job and he's really good, but man, just arrogant and haughty and, you know, not nice. But the reality is, When I would deal with that person and try to help them and try to get them to change and they wouldn't, as soon as you get rid of them, everyone else, the attitude jumps. And by the way, they covered all the things that he did and we got through it anyway. So David says, these proud, haughty, arrogant people, I'm not going to endure them no matter how they can help in my government. Remember Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. But James 4, 5 says, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. The humble. The fifth type of person that David commits not to allow himself to be influenced by are the liars. Verse 7. The liars, he who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. They're liars. They're deceitful. They speak falsehoods. They just lie. And sometimes we forget, and I forget, what exactly it means to tell a lie and what a liar is. And that's why I always go back to the definitions in the the English dictionary so we're all on the same page. And it's just so helpful for me where it says a liar is one who declares as a fact what he knows to be not true with the intent to deceive another. You know, we tell lies and we talk about little white lies and things like that and, 
and we kind of flippantly do it, but there's intent behind that lie to deceive someone else. Like the apostate, they hate the truth. They're always trying to deceive people so that they can get what they want and have their way and glorify themselves. You can't trust them. They're liars. Remember, Jesus said, liars are from their father, the devil. John 8, 44. He said he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Those people who are telling, the, telling lies, they're just the mouthpiece of Satan. You don't want them influencing you. Zechariah 8.16 says, These are the things which you should do. Speak the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment for peace in your gates. David knew that he could not allow liars to have influence in his life. And notice how he describes that. He says, He who has... In verse, let's see, verse 7, he who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. I've got to get rid of them. I've got to get, have them no influence in my life. I've got to get them out. They're not going to be close to me. They're not going to be in my inner circle. They're not going to dwell with me. I don't want them around. So we have the apostate and the perverse, the gossips, the prideful, the liars. And Proverbs 6, 16 says, God hates them. He says, there are six things which the Lord hates, and yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among his brothers. If the Lord hates them, should we let them influence us? Not at all. They're not going to help us keep our commitment to the blameless way. And so we have all of these people we shouldn't allow to influence. Well, who should we allow? We've been through almost the whole chapter here, the whole psalm. What's left? Well, David also describes some of the people that he would allow to into his home the ones he would allow to the inner circle of his kingdom, his close friends, those he would allow to influence him and help him keep his commitment to a blameless life. And these are the people we too should allow to influence us. Who we should allow to influence our lives are found in verse 6. He says, My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He whose walk is in, walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. Simple list, right? Just two. But it encompasses so much. The faithful and the blameless. The faithful. Those who are faithful to God. Those who are faithful to His Word. Those who are faithful to God's people. Those who are striving like you to keep a commitment to a blameless life before God. They're faithful. They are faithful to be here. They are faithful to pray for you. They are faithful to encourage you. They are faithful to enjoy, exhort you. They are faithful to bear your burdens. They are faithful to practice all of them, one another's with you. And then we just committed to that today in membership, right? They're committed. They are faithful. They are faithful to God first and they are faithful to us. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. They are committed to that. They are faithful to do what God has called us to do. They are thinking about, they are considering how they can encourage you every Saturday before they come to church on Sunday. They are thinking about it during the week as they are praying for you and they send you a text or they call you or they email. And like, I am praying for you. I am helping you. Is there anything I can do for you? This is what they are. They are faithful. They know it. 
the faithful man is iron sharpens a man, so iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. That the faithful older women who are discipling young women to be pure and chaste and holy and love their husbands and children. They're faithful. And the blameless, right? Who are the blameless? They're, they're believers. Those who have been declared blameless by God, who he chose before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him, even as we read this morning. Those who love God and sing his praises and exhibit his attributes, who follow and live by his word, who fear God and turn away from evil. They're committed to God at home. They're committed to God at church. They're committed to God at work and wherever they are because they are blameless. They are above reproach. It is such a joy to be influenced by godly people. To have, as, as Ryan taught us last week, to have the same spirit, to be diligent to pursue the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace and humility and grace and kindness. To have the same heart for God, the same heart for Christ, the same desire to grow in Christ likeness. To be around people who will encourage and comfort and pray for you and point you to Christ and point you to God's word. As they live their life, it's someone you can follow as they follow Christ. What a blessing. What a joy. And understand that this local church is not the only place to find faithful and blameless people. But by the way, it is the primary place that God has ordained for us to keep find the faithful and blameless to help us to keep our commitment to a blameless life. This is where we commit. To God and to one another and to his word. And he will help us to keep that commitment to each other and to him to live that blameless life. And what a great contrast the faithful and blameless are to those who we shouldn't allow to influence us. The faithful rather than the apostate. The teachable rather than the perverse. They're able to confide in them rather than the gossips. They are humble rather than proud. They are trustworthy rather than liars. Faithful and blameless. And notice David says, I'm going to be looking for them. Verse 6, my eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. And they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister me. I'm going to be looking for them. I'm going to be watching for them. And I'm going to ask them into my home. And I want them to dwell with me. And I want them to influence me. I want them to minister to me. I want them to be a part of my life. I want to welcome them into my inner circle. I want them to help me to keep my commitment to the blameless way. You seek them out. You ask them to disciple you. Can I follow you as you follow Christ? I'm so thankful our church is committed to that. I have never seen it anywhere else. The way that we do it here. To love each other that much. By the way, some of you may be asking, in light of all these types of people, I should not allow to influence me. Does that mean I should quit my job if I work around unbelievers? Should I not associate with unbelieving neighbors? Should I avoid my unbelieving family members at Thanksgiving? Well, the answer is this. It is a question of influence. Who is influencing whom? Is it helping or hindering your commitment to the Lord? This is what David is talking about. The people who it would influence him as king. And we understand very clearly, even from our reading this morning in, second, in uh, Philippians 2.15, that the Lord wants us to be a godly influence in the world, right? He says, we are to prove ourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom we appear as lights in the world holding forth the word of life. And it has the idea of we are serving them the gospel. And so we're to be there as we are blameless and innocent children of God. And so it's not isolation from the world that David is calling us to. It is not assimilation with the world. But we are on mission to the world. 
to proclaim the gospel, to show them what a blameless life is like and show them how God can help us to do that. Evangelize them, yes. But spend more time with believers than unbelievers. The reality is, some of you may need to change those relationships in your life. You may need to change jobs. You may need to avoid certain co-workers or maybe even certain family members. If you're a new believer, saved out of a life of drug addiction or alcoholism or prostitution or something like that, you may need to get all new friends. You may have to start all over. Thankfully, you have a new family. It may be too much of a temptation for you to go back and evangelize them. But before you make any of those decisions, make sure you pray and you meditate on Psalm 101 and make sure, like David, that you seek counsel from faithful and blameless people around you. You may just need encouragement. You may just need prayer for boldness and witnessing. But you may also need a faithful brother or sister in Christ to look you in the eye and say, it looks like you are the one being influenced in this relationship. And it is hindering you from keeping your commitment to a blameless life. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. And so if you have made a commitment to live a blameless life before God, David reminds us that keeping that commitment begins in our home, in our heart, in our personal walk with the Lord. And that commitment will be influenced for better or for worse by what we allow into our lives and who we allow into our lives to influence us. So to keep our commitment to a blameless life, we must guard those two key influences in our lives. And second, and the last here, we'll finish with this. We must practice the two key disciplines of our lives found in verse 8. David says, Every morning I will destroy all the wicked of the land so as to cut off from the city of the Lord all those who do iniquity. And so the first practice, the first key discipline we must practice is we must be diligent. David, as the king of Israel, is committed to rid his kingdom of all the wickedness, all those who do iniquity, and doing it judging justly with loving kindness. But notice that he said, every morning, I'm going to do this. He knows he must be diligent to keep his commitment. Because keeping a commitment to a blameless life before the Lord is not something that you do one time and write it down and refer back to it once in a while. Every morning, every day of our life, we must get up and remind ourselves of the commitment we have made. Living a blameless life takes constant effort. Every morning we are to be praising the Lord and meditating on His Word. And we need to compare our life to His Word and ask ourselves, how am I living up to my commitment? Is there something or someone that I need to remove from my life that is tempting me away? Is there something or someone I need to add to my life that would help me to keep my commitment? Do I need some accountability? We must be diligent to keep our commitment. And second, David shows us we must be dependent. And I skipped over that second part of verse 2 and now we're there. You were wondering about that. Hopefully it didn't distract you the whole time. You missed it. As David begins, he says, I will give heed to the blameless way. When will you come to me? David knows and we know that he must be dependent on God in his power, by his grace, to be able to do any of these things. And he begins his prayer that way. Oh, Lord, when will you come to me? I cannot keep this commitment without your help. I can't do it without you. Neither can you or I. And so this commitment begins with committing our, our, our lives to the Lord. Meaning our lives, our, our lives and, our, and our whole being to God through Jesus Christ. And Jesus says this in John 15, 1, Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Philippians 2.12 says this, We work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is God working in us to help us keep this commitment. Colossians 1.29, Paul says, For this person I also purpose, I also labor, striving according to his power, which mightily worked within me. And so we must realize that we are dependent on God to do this in any way we can to keep our commitment. And if you're here today and you're not a believer and you agree with all of these things, like, yeah, I don't like liars, I don't know apostate, perverse, gossip, I don't like them either. I want to be around the nice people, the blameless and the faithful. Yeah, I want to be around them too. Do you understand that these are universal truths because all people feel this way? And do you understand that they're universal truths because God has written his word on your heart? What you are affirming is there is a creator God who created you. And he's a holy God. And he will judge that sin of them and of you unless you repent and believe that Christ died for your sin. And he arose from the grave. And he is coming back to judge. You believe this, like all humans do. There is hope for change because you may be one of those people. You found yourself gossiping, lying, slandering, being proud, and you're sick of it. There's hope for change. There's hope for forgiveness. And there's hope for eternal life in heaven. So to keep our commitment to a blameless life, we must practice these two key disciplines in our lives, diligence and dependence. We must guard the two key influences in our lives, the what and the who we allow to influence us. And many of you know that this is a bold and God-honoring plan and commitment that David made to fulfill his purpose for his life, God's purpose for his life as king of Israel, but he fell far short. And that is recorded in 1 Samuel 11 and 12, or 2 Samuel 11 and 12, in his sin with Bathsheba. He did not walk with integrity in his home. He gave in to deceit and adultery and murder. But you know, when David was confronted with his sin by a faithful and blameless friend named Nathan, who was an influence in his life, David did what everyone should do to be forgiven. He fell on his face before a holy God and he repented. And his repentance and his sinner's prayer is found in Psalm 51. And maybe that needs to be ours as well. When we fall into sin. But David truly repented. He turned from his sin. He turned from his wicked ways. He turned to follow the ways of God again. And he determined again to keep his commitment to lead a blameless life before God. And God continued to use this forgiven sinner in amazing ways. And we have so many psalms that help us to draw closer to God that he wrote. And even in this, God used his Holy Spirit inspired words to help us to keep our commitment. So if you have failed, don't give up. Confess your sin and God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and he will save you and he will help you to keep your commitment. Because in the end, as in the beginning, David is known as a man after God's own heart. Not perfect, but pursuing blamelessness. So in closing, this one man said this, This psalm is doubly moving both for the ideals it discloses and for the shadow of failure which history throws across it. But happily, the last word is not with David, but with the son of David, Jesus Christ, upon whom there's no no shadow of failure. He was tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. It was Jesus' commitment to do the will of the Father, and he did it perfectly. And he did it so that he would be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. 
And God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And when we put our faith in Christ, the Father credits his perfect, sinless, blameless life to our account and our sinful, wretched life to his account. And his death on the cross satisfies God's wrath and we are forgiven. We just repent and believe. And because we are given that new heart to believe and to live for our Lord and Savior, we too commit ourselves to a blameless life. And we can, with the help of the Holy Spirit-inspired words of David in Psalm 101, keep our commitment.